Howdy, y'all. Samson Folk here with Evan Gualberto, of course, on this wonderful YouTube channel that he's crafted through all these years. The, the number one hub for esoteric highlight packages, and he's got you covered. My favorite this, this week, you, you might think it would be the Kyle Lowry one, but it's actually Colin Sexton, because I like to learn. And I hope that's what you're here for, learning. Because we teach. And we do it as we bounce around. Okay, Evan, we're here to talk basketball. And we're here to talk the good kind of basketball. I just finished listening to a podcast where there were two completely separate conversations happening. And they, they did not find a middle ground. They just kept trading back and forth. They're very polite about it. You and I rarely disagree. I, I tend to think we build upon one another. And that brings us to the game of the week for you. That's right, we're hopping right into it. Okay, and you've got the Celtics and the Pistons. You'll talk about it. I also saw a Celtics game this week and we'll build from there. But your game of the week, what, did you, what are your takeaways right off the bat? So we were talking about this off the pod, just right off the jump, is there's, I might be being stupid, but there's no one place to look at games that have gone into overtime, how many, which team has gone into overtime the most this season. Based on pure feel, um, the Pistons feel like they've been in a bunch of overtime games. The truth is they've only been in four but they've been in two very recently. So with the double overtime game against the Lakers. So the Pistons, again, it's a feel thing. The Pistons feel like they're in a lot of games. And I don't necessarily know if that's always been true throughout the season, but the Pistons eked out a win against the Celtics. So did you, did you catch the highlights? Do you know anything about this game? I know nothing about this game. And I will build upon what you're saying, though, is that how insane is it that virtually, if you, if you follow Premier League, Calcio A, La Liga, whatever, right? Or NHL, NFL, they'll have a tab. Like, they'll have a column that says OT, dr like tie, draw, whatever. Because that's, people are interested to know. The NBA... To hell with that. They don't care. Why? Just throw it in there. You have all of it. You have all of the columns, all of the stats. Just do it. Give us more. I, they switched the, the mobile app as far as the box scores. They segmented the starters away from the bench, even though they already did that. They just added a big gray line thr running through <laughs> it. So, like, if you can do that, just take that big gray line, flip it this way vertically, Make it clear and add OT and then just run their records through it. I fixed your site. You're welcome, NBA. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we, can get, if we can get LeBron to tweet that, there may be some – we might see some action. Fingers so, crossed. yeah, the Celtics, there were dueling 30-point games on the – the game was on the 12th. Dueling 30-point games. Jason Tatum and – I won't make you guess it. There's, there's no Sadiq Bay. Sadiq Big shout Bay, out. 27 minutes off the bench, 10 for 12, 7 for 7 from three, and 12 rebounds. Sadiq Bay, I just, before we get into the game game, there's just something about these Villanova players Mikhail, Brunson, Josh Hart, DiVincenzo, even Archie Diacono, fine. Eric Pascal. And, you know, the, the oldest one in the league, Kyle Lowry, just, they just, I don't, maybe, maybe this is secretly my catnip, um, not so secretly my catnip, but I just am such a huge fan. And they're just, they're just always there. I'll but tell yeah, you Sadiq this, Bay by was, the way, Daryl Reynolds, the guy I've interviewed from Villanova, he coaches there and he played overseas for a little bit. They're all indoctrinated, by the way. They have something going on in Villanova that they just carry that for the rest of their lives. And they, like, to the point where Daryl Reynolds was like, I love Villanova ball so much. When I was asking him, 
hey, you like Philly. You're from Philly. Who's your favorite player on the 76ers? This dude said TJ McConnell because he <laughs> thought he played Villanova style ball. It's like Embiid is oh, right there, oh. the guy. Jimmy okay. Butler was on that team at the time. And this guy said TJ McConnell. They're indoctrinated. Absolutely. Respect it. I respect it. Jay Wright <laughs> is just so – there's just some – you can't not like Jay Wright, I don't think. He's the Michael Shannon of college basketball. Tap the microphone. I, I clap my hands, <laughs> but I, uh, where to start? Jason Tatum, like I said, 33 points, 11 rebounds, 7 assists. Solid game. Um, not the most efficient from the field, 9 for 22, but thir- 12 of 13 from the line. Jalen Brown, 27 points, did some more Jalen Brownie things, the Nightwing Award winner. He just does it from just about everywhere. I'll have, we can have like a minute long clip running of Jalen just doing Jalen things. But aside from that, you'd be surprised to know that Daniel Tice with 11 was the only other Celtic in double digits. I just, no Kemba Walker, uh, Grant Williams foul trouble. Um, but yeah, didn't, didn't play a whole lot. It was just, it was weird because I also, I've been curious about the Pistons for a little while, but I've never really watched the outside of Jeremy Grant. It just, there's, there's just no pop that, you know, that they're interesting, but they only have seven wins on the season. So I should clarify the reason I've been curious about them for a while is Blake Griffin. And we can talk about him a little more, but just really quickly, there was the DeLon Wright sighting. Um, he did some fun, interesting stuff he's another guy who i feel that his impact the mavericks are really missing that type of player and i know we talked about this when we were talking about um the troy barnes award from last week but yeah the mavericks are starting to figure stuff out but you can see that delon doing what he does brings so much to a team he doesn't have to be your best guy he's never going to be your best but if, he, if you are bringing him off the bench and he can do his stuff, a lot of good things can happen. I love DeLon Wright. There is a very selfish part of me because he was one of my favorite players on the Raptors. I just, his amoebic game that is like sticky and kind of shifty all the time. He's like some sort of thing that like regenerates its limbs all kind of like, and that's his drive. It's all steppy, sticky, and amoebic. And by the way, that's coined by Blake Murphy, uh, amoebic to describe Delon Wright way back in 2015, I think. But I love Delon. A selfish part of me wants to look at a timeline where Delon Wright was put in all the situations that Fred Van Vliet was and just wondering how that career ends up. I think that's really interesting. The Pistons, I've caught like nothing of them this year. Okay, so let's talk Blake Griffin then. A man who is very interesting to you. What are your thoughts on him? What makes him such a hot topic for you and made you go seek out a Pistons game to figure things out? Small sample size so far, but one of the two will obviously be Blake. But let me give you, let me give you two sets of stats in terms of where their shots are coming from. Player A, 51% of their shots are coming from behind the arc, 27 at the rim. 27% at the rim, and 17% come from the short mid-range. An effective field goal percentage of 56.4. Player B, 51% of his shots are coming from behind the arc, 22% at the rim, 22% from short mid-range. An effective field goal percentage of 46.1. So 56.4, 46.1 effective field goal percentage. I'll have you know, I was looking at Blake Griffin's rim frequency, et cetera, and uh, his numbers the other day, and he's the worst one. Like almost. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any guesses as to who the other one could be? I have no idea. Brooke Lopez. Big shout out, my guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's just so weird because if you haven't watched any Pistons, Blake Griffin, as you know, he was hit with, has been hit with a lot of injuries and surgeries and is coming back from all of that stuff. Time will tell if this is the type of player he is for the rest of his career, however long that is. But 
he is not doing great and he's not shooting great. So the fact that half of his, more than half of his shots are coming from behind the arc, shooting 32% from out there, it doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. He's not getting to the free throw line. He averages th- three trips a game, shooting 77% from there. I just, the decline of Blake Griffin, it's he, interesting stat that I feel this one my, people might know. No dunks on the season. I don't know what to say or do about Blake and the, the massive shift in play style. But outside of looking for his own shot, he's been solid as a playmaker and as a passer. Would I personally like to see somebody with his decision-making and passing chops and handle do more? Yeah, but I understand that it's a, it's a rebuilding team and you want the ball in the hands of guys like Jeremy Grant and Sadiq Bey. Two years removed, I believe, from a borderline all-NBA season. Blake Griffin. Yes. That's a hell of a thing. And the no dunks thing, as with Russell Westbrook, hardly any dunks on the season. I talked about this last week. We are in the midst of a transformative part of of the NBA. Things are shifting away from the players we've known for so long. And their play style, if they're even hanging around, is very different. The only holdover, basically, is LeBron James. And because he's around, people underestimate how much the face of the league has started to change. Or the the eyebrows, the eyes, everything, but the mouth of the league, LeBron, is still there. It's all changing. And once the mouth goes and there's a completely different voice, everyone's going to sit back and go, oh, holy shit, what is this NBA? Like, what am I looking at? And hopefully people find players that they can identify with and love because there's a lot of good stuff out there. Blake has had so much to deal with. He's always been an incredibly cerebral player. As you say, maybe he's better as a creator and having the ball in his hands. And obviously his shot making has fallen off with his athleticism. So he hasn't been able to flex the best parts of his game as often as possible. But I guess they have a guy in Detroit, Jeremy Grant, who is flexing all different parts of his game at all different times. What about him? Do they, run, do they have any fun wrinkles offensively or defensively in Detroit, those two things? It's just, it would, it's no surprise to anybody who's been watching them, but as somebody, like, I will happily admit this, I'm wrong a lot, uh, that's fine, but I can only speak to what I have seen. And I didn't know that Jeremy Grant, outside of the highlights from earlier this season, because he had such a hot start. I didn't know they ran so much stuff for him to be not necessarily on ball because technically guys are on ball if you have them in dribble handoff situations and they're turning and going downhill, but just... So Jeremy, obviously career best usage. He's, he's doing some stuff as a... They're using him as a pick and roll ball handler, which there are going to be a lot of growing pains. I don't necessarily want to compare him to Bam in the way that Miami uses him because they are very different. But these are the type of things that if you believe Jeremy is the guy who can do this type of stuff for you, you let him, you let him go through these struggles because ultimately it will be much better for you. We talked about this before, Tyler Hero as a point guard. Is that the answer? No. Does it make him a better player? Yes. As a spot-up shooter, he has been, he's surprised me. He surprised me. So he does a lot of things that are good, not great, but he's so skilled at the things he is great at, getting downhill, turning the corner, being the role man. So you can use him in either situation. Handoffs. I think he's even, he's, he's impressed me in, in his isolation play too, so. Okay, so they run a bunch of stuff for him. Sadiq Bey, as you say, dueling 30-point games. For his part, huge scoring bump. What, what was the key to that? Are these just spot-ups? Is he attacking closeouts? What is Sadiq Bey doing that he's popping off for 30-plus against the Celtics? I think it's just 
for me, I've always, I've always believed that Brad is going to take Brad Stevens is going to take away your number one option. And so that's largely what they did is Jeremy was held in check for most of the game. He, nothing, I was expecting him to have a big ish game, but 16, 16 shot attempts, five for 16, um, you know, they, they forced him into some tough spots. And so it became Sadiq just finding space, finding space. He's just, he's flaring to the wing. He's in, when a player goes to dig, he's just helping off. He hit, he hit the triple, the dagger to um, ice the game. And it was from deep and he just pulled and it was a byproduct of, you know, just this guy is getting looks, he's getting looks, he's getting looks. And Grant Williams did help off when he didn't need to on that last play. But when, when a guy is six for six from three and he has been stroking it, just stay on him, stay connected. And that's what I think the Celtics didn't do. And in fairness to them, that's, this is Sadiq's best game so far. So, you know, is he on the scout? Yeah, probably. But did you know he could go off for 30? No, because he's never gone off for more than 20 in a game. Celtics now, who just, as we're recording this, lost 104 to 91 to the Wizards. Uh, that's crazy, man. That's and a much flattering, th- that's a much more flattering scoreline than when I last checked. Yeah. Okay, so when the Raptors played the Celtics, and I'll just run through Tatum, Brown, got downhill, basically at will. They drew secondary defenders. They drew help all the time. Kemba, Semi Ojale, and Peyton Pritchard, all three of them took eight shots respectively from downtown. Six, six, and five. Those are the makes that they had. So they went 17 for 24. You talked about it in this Pistons games. In the Pistons game, the Celtics did not have a lot of secondary scoring. Against the Raptors, they had an abundance of it. And that's when the Celtics are really dangerous is when guys hit their shots. And the question is, right, is Daniel Tice, semi Ojale, and Peyton Pritchard the kind of stuff that is going to consistently provide a winning formula for the Celtics into the postseason? Because Brown and Tatum are there. Even though Tatum had a bad game today, they are there. As you say, the Nightwing Award is not awarded easily. You got to earn it. And Tatum... I mean, on any given night, he can be top 10. Immensely talented. The passing keeps growing. They're both working on their shot making, and they're both already above average at it. The Celtics decimated the Raptors because their secondary options, tertiary options, were dangerous. And the Celtics, it sounds like in that game, that wasn't the case. Why do you think that is? Is it just bad Raptors luck? Or do you view it as this, the Celtics were doing something poorly to create for their secondary guys? What's, what's the case? Well, the easiest thing to point to just right away would be Kemba Walker. Kemba Walker played in the first game, the first night of a back-to-back, and the Pistons caught them on the second night. So you take away Kemba had – a a decent game would you say he he was hitting from three i i know that against the raptors he had a couple he had a couple nice possessions that ended in scoring or playmaking as a second side action guy and he was i would say generally quite helpful for them right and so that's the thing about it is that when you look at the celtics tatum is a superstar brown is emerging as a superstar but when those two are together, there there's so much they can do. And Brown being able to hold it down, hold the second units or unit lineups without Tatum down, that's great. But it allows the opposing team to key in on just the one guy. So there's only so much you can do in terms of staggering Tatum and Brown. And Jeff Teague, for former All-Star, you, you have that, he has that on his resume. He 
there are nights that he's going to have it and there are going to be nights that he doesn't. And this night he was relatively efficient, 22 minutes, you know, hit a couple of threes, did some stuff, but not really going to be the difference maker for you. And that's the difference between having, and of course, Marcus Smart is hurt. So that has to be something that's said. It's just so much easier when you have on-ball creators like Tatum and Kemba and, like I continue to say, Brown is emerging. So I think it's just that. It's just you have that other guy and guys can get hot early and then everybody can get rolling. And then you have to close out harder. You have to make more of these adjustments. Whereas if you, without Kemba, now you're now – you're, fighting for your life you're trying to produce some stuff you or tatum is overexerting himself nine of nine for 22 like i said not the most efficient of his shooting nights but that's really all it is i think when i watch the celtics i always watch for the staggered screen actions i love how much staggered screen actions they run i think it's a, an underrated play and underused in the nba i just think it opens up a bunch of different lanes all at the same time. And there's so many different options. And I'll get to that with the 76ers, but Thompson, Tice, and I should say Teague wasn't available for the Raptors game either. And neither was smart, but Thompson, Tice, famously no Miles Turner. A lot of people are very hung up on that. And, you know, rightfully so, a guy who's in DPOY talks, that'll probably die down as the year goes on. But he came out, and Turner has been immense defensively this year. Thompson Tice, what are your thoughts on the front court situation? There's not a lot that Tice is doing wrong. He's just not as big as you need him to be. He is not – if he was a little stronger, a little surlier, a little more in built like – Bam, maybe. Grant Williams. <laughs> yeah, okay. But he's, he's just, he's, he's good. And there is, we do, under, we do underrate what Tice does. He does everything you would want a player in his role to do. It's just that at times you are asking more from him than he can provide. And there are some nights he's going to be able to give it to you somehow, some way. But there, um, no Time Lord also against against mm-hmm. the Pistons. I didn't really think about that when I was watching them play, but yeah, so no Time Lord. Tice playing 31 minutes, Tristan playing 16, 17, something like that. They are now you're starved for offense because that vertical threat, Tice does provide some vertical threat, but nowhere near the level that Time Lord does. So they're fine. I don't I know a bunch of Celtics fans some of them do are complaining about not getting Miles Turner because if you can get a guy for a guy who's basically out the door anyway why not but this is this is who they have and they're betting on the growth of their young guys and maybe being able to get a guy on the market somebody a buyout guy or a fringe guy because I've heard you talk 28 about 28 million Twenty-eight million trade exception too, which right. that greases the wheels in a lot of trade situations. Yeah, absolutely. And so, if you can, if you can go get a guy that will help with that, perfect. But you never—I've heard you say this: you you either want a top shelf big man or a bargain bin big man. You don't want the in between of you're overpaying, but he's not giving you as much as you need. And for what they have Tice for, that's fine. But he's he's limited. That's it. Yeah. Overpaying big men who aren't one of the best at their position is a recipe for disaster because it, it, it typically puts a hard cap on what your team is able to do. But as you say, Tice does everything. I love Tice. He was, he was top 70 in my top 100 players. I think he is an exemplary big man. It's just, as you say, that tertiary shot making, Tice complements shot makers because he's a wheel greaser offensively. If you need a release valve, especially at the bucket, pop it up to him. 
He can go get it for a lob. He can hit a jumper every once in a while. He'll release pressure. But he can't wheel grease for spot-ups that, that aren't going in. If, a, if guys are getting open shots, if they're getting good opportunities and just not taking advantage of it, Tice is not going to radically change your offense. If you have guys going, he's going to move a lot of guys around screening. He's going to seal. He's going to be flying around the court, and he'll get on the offensive glass. And defensively, he's really good. I thought the Celtics last year, they needed to figure out the whole small ball thing with Tice at the five, Hayward, Tatum, Brown, Kemba, Smart, whatever the mix of it was. And so Tice was a really perfect center for the situation they had last year. It's just the roster is a little bit understaffed for how they're trying to play and what it requires of Tatum and Brown, I think. Currently, that's my diagnosis of it. And they're still good because they have a lot of top-end talent, but they, they have top-end talent that needs to be serviced in some way. And I'm just waiting for that to happen via trade or whatever else. You know, they, they have time, but you don't want to waste years where guys are on contract. Yeah. If you just, just looking at the numbers, how tall is Daniel Tice? You know, there's only six so nine, much. I think. Yeah, but about 6'9". Jason Tatum is about 6'9", 6'8", 6'9", something like that, I believe. So if he's your – he does a lot, and he – I believe he does over-deliver in his role based on what they are asking him to do, as you were talking about. The Gortat seals to, to Gortat a screen is – if you guys don't know about this, I'll link to the video of the Celtics specifically doing it for Jason Tatum. It's Daniel Tice a lot. It's – it when you roll and then you – inside seal like you're posting up but it basically clears the lane for a driving player to get to the bucket tice is one of the best at that to the point that other people in the league I, i've read this in a few places are calling it the tice or something some some sort of reference with boston i don't like that at all it's the gortat it always has been but i really do think he over delivers in his role and that's that's the problem with it is that I, I, I keep coming back to there's only so much he can do. And like, that's the thing. Al Horford was similar. Al Horford over-delivered basically his whole time in Boston. It's just Isaiah Thomas was the lead ball handler and there were limitations to that. And there's always, it's just hard to build a championship roster. It is one of the most difficult things to do. And especially in the NBA where, you have LeBron or you don't for a lot of teams for a lot of years. Okay. Any other Celtics Pistons thoughts? No, not really. It is just really hard to win without having a championship level big man kind of, we can segue into your game of the week. I did and my it. game of the week. And you did me a huge favor because I support lefties. Always will always have. And De'Aaron Fox, one of us lefties prospering immensely lately. Player of the Week, great interview with Zach Lowe on the low post. Such a likable guy. I got to watch him do battle against the 76ers defense that was very, very interested in stopping him. And I got to see, I got to watch the 76ers for a little bit more of their playbook and how simplistic some of the actions they run are but that's exactly what they've needed is just simpler actions with Embiid, Simmons, and guys like Curry and Green and Harris and Shake Milton all to compliment them. I watched these two teams go at it and I have some thoughts and it makes me quite high on the 76ers and just I got to marvel at, uh, at De'Aaron Fox. That's, that's the first thing off the bat. De'Aaron, he talked about this on the low post. He said, it's crazy the difference it makes now that guys are chasing over the top of screens on him. And for a guy as rapid as Fox, agreed. And watching quite a few of Fox's games this year, agreed. The crazy thing about this game is the Sixers were like, we're going under, so do your worst. And he still cooked them. Like, he went 13 of 30 from the floor, and the 76ers are a hard team to score on, especially at the bucket where, you know, Joel Embiid resides. And that's no small thing. It's quite a big thing. 
maybe the biggest, you know, per pound and height in the NBA. And Ben Simmons, very few people can test shots from behind or from the side like Ben Simmons. And Darren Fox, who's worked so many of those little jab, step back out, and hit from like 11 to 17 feet, Ben Simmons in your area is actually like a super big deal. And that was reflected in his shooting numbers. De'Aaron Fox wasn't able to get to the rim at will, wasn't able to get into those comfortable little pop shots all the time. However, comma, he still impressed the hell out of me. He put Danny, when Danny Green was on De'Aaron Fox, <laughs> too bad, man, game over. Like that was the, the craziest thing to me watching this game is how comfortable De'Aaron was saying, no, no screen help, I'll, I'll be okay. And he would just be at the rim the next second. And he's paying attention to Joel Embiid's three seconds in the key. And he's watching when that step out is coming. And he's like, beat him to the glass. And Dwight Howard, too, who goaltended like seven shots in this game, by the way. And so De'Aaron Fox doing his damn thing. They ran a Spain pick and roll. And Marvin Bagley caught a lob on the back end of it. Basically, Evan's dream loves Spain pick and rolls to lobs. I know the Raptors are on a few and uh, last year that he appreciated a lot. And Buddy doing his thing, pulling up. They tried to get as much in transition as they could. I respect them trying to do that. They realized the Sixers are really hard to beat in the half court. Halliburton, my God, Tyrese Halliburton doing his thing all the time. He's so comfortable making reads as a decision maker on the back end. Now, as a primary guy, they don't use him that much. And I I get that when you have guys like Heald who wants the ball and you want to reward him because he's a big part of the team, that's part of it. And then there's Fox who you just want to give him the ball and say, please do something with it. Go into a pick and roll with Holmes or Bagley, whatever. Try and make it work. Find the advantage. They're doing that all game. But when the ball squirts out to Halliburton and the Kings love their healed Fox Halliburton guard lineup. Oh yeah. When the ball comes out to Halliburton, he's so good at attacking a closeout, finding the weak foot, getting into the middle of the court for either his own shot from there or a pass out to an open shooter, which with Barnes, you know, having a great year healed, rotating, relocating all the time. And Fox who's better now, it's more dangerous. He doesn't get to the rim a ton. Like Hal Burton is always finishing in the in-between and getting around into soft spots. But I, Hal Burton, as we talked about last week, just fantastic. The Kings impressed me. They turned their season around basically with transition defense and going from basically the worst transition defense to one of the best over these past few weeks. The 76ers, they still got banned out a couple times, but they hung on by shot making and they, they went punch for punch with the Sixers until the very end. They had a lot of really fun sets. They ran at the end for Rashawn Holmes to get to the rim, De'Aaron Fox to make crazy shots. And my last thing on the Kings is that De'Aaron Fox clearly is starting to get whatever the it is. Some players in the NBA understand timely shot making And it's clear by the way that the tempo of this game goes that De'Aaron Fox has a presence of mind for when shots have to be made and when he has to kind of commandeer the offense. That's really important. A lot of players never get that. They just kind of move through the game, see what happens. But De'Aaron, he he had a lot of run stoppers and run starters. And I thought that was immense. So I'm very impressed with that team. Sacramento has been doing some stuff lately that oh, I, I wish I, I wish I knew how to pronounce his name for sure. I know he goes by coach spins, but um, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot my Adam Spinella who does um, on Twitter um, S P I N E double L A. He does these um, things called the daily ATO where he breaks down a couple of sets or not necessarily breaks down a couple of sets. He isolates some sets and he tweets it out and it's like the five best sets of the night in his opinion. And he just, so I always see it. I always see, Oh, can I steal some stuff from that? But it's, there's always 
some sort of Sacramento stuff happening. There's always that stuff in the clips. And it's just so much fun because I don't, I didn't watch a lot of Sacramento. I haven't watched a lot of Sacramento, but I knew that they, but that De'Aaron Fox was sort of making this mini leap because that's the only thing that people talk about from Sacramento. Uh, also Harrison Barnes, you know, still also, doing some stuff. Rashawn Holmes gets, Sacramento gets a lot of attention from Raptors Twitter because of a certain Rashawn Holmes. <laughs> And yeah. I take credit for that. <laughs> you should. You should. They are they're very good. So recently, um, Coach Spins came out with uh, a YouTube video that was just film study of the Sacramento Kings. And it's just, um, I will link it in the description below. It's, it's a nerd's dream. It's a nerd's dream. It's just so fun to watch. It begin, the video begins with, different Spain pick and roll looks. So I know you might enjoy it. I know I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoy it so much, but it's just what you'll notice is it's Fox giving up the ball. And this is something I like about both De'Aaron Fox and John Morant is their willingness to give up the ball and then work, make the defense shift with their off ball activity and then work to come all the way around to go get it. Now you're looking at a second side, third side pick and roll with De'Aaron Fox with already a full head of steam. He's turning the corner. He is going. And a lot of the time, it's, it's not even for him. It's, it's misdirection action and a weak side guy is ducking in and then it's just over. But th- like you said, whatever it is that De'Aaron Fox is finding his way or growing into – He's just, he can do, he can just do so many things and he's making so many great reads and he's so fast that once the game slows down for him even more, it's over. It's so good. The pull-up is obviously going to, if the pull-up gets to a place where it's really, really good, Darren Fox should be, and I don't think this is hot take, he should be starting to vault himself into MVP type player because the weapons he has at his disposal are immense, but they become fatal for other teams. If he's getting a step from screen help from the jump consistently, just, and he's huge. He's very quick that sometimes you don't notice how tall he is, but six, five, he's a big guard. And when he goes downhill, he can finish around or over most defenders at the rim. He is immense and just waiting to see if everything unlocks in a timely fashion for him because he's a player to watch for anybody. He, he should be – there's no reason that he can't be one of the guys in the league. I'm, I'm looking at Darren Fox like this guy will be an MVP conversation someday. I don't know if it will be an elongated one. It's not going to be James Harden – every year for six years, but he'll, he'll find his way into some, I'm almost certain of it. He's such an immense player. Philly. Okay. A bunch of things off the start. Philly won this game. I think because shake Milton and Dwight Howard had a moment. They had a moment and they found like a really sneakily good two man game that I was like, what the hell Dwight and shake have a two man game. Who said this was a thing? I came in the game expecting, yes, Seth Curry, Joel Embiid, they're going to work off each other. And they did. And they were really, really impressive. But having those bench minutes with Shake and Dwight to kind of sustain the offense, that's immense. Because what have the 76ers been looking for, for what, four years? A bench big to replace Joel so they're not getting bludgeoned in all the minutes that he's not out there. They, would they have won the chip if they had a good bench big if they, when they're playing the Raptors? I mean, probably. They won Joel's minutes by, like, they were plus 90 in Joel's minutes over the series with the Raptors, and they just got hammered when he was off the floor. Joel has always been this guy. I just think they finally tailored a team to him. They finally did it, and now everybody's like, oh, Joel Embiid is some MVP. Like, yeah. He's been there. He's immense. He's a defensive player of the year nominee every year. And okay, this game specifically, sorry, 
the Kings overloaded. This is my favorite thing that the 76ers did this game. The Kings overloaded the post actions. Of course, that is what happens with Joe Embiid. Rashawn Holmes is a muscly worm, muscular worm. As I said in my top 100, <laughs> He's a muscular yeah. worm, but he is not muscly or muscular enough to hold Joel Embiid, to wrap him up, okay, like SpongeBob. Here's the thing. They overload, they double, Embiid makes the requisite passes. The shot making goes down a little bit. So what is the response? A little bit of horns action. So they put Embiid at the top, ball in hand, and they can run Shake and Tobias. They can run Curry and Tobias. They can even put Simmons in it. And I just... It's beautiful to watch a simplistic action like horns and just say, let's put our best players in it. Let's watch and see what the defense does. Embiid can make the pass downhill into the post. He can go into the dribble handoff. He can turn the corner. Or if he wants to get really crazy, he can face up and hit a mid-range jumper. Because by the way, Joel Embiid is the best mid-range shooter in the NBA this year. Excuse me? What the hell? Who said you're allowed to be that good? from the mid-range when you're a big monster in the post. He did, apparently. So I love that they go into that action. They run a ton of stuff for MB just to have cutters coming off of him headed downhill or running around him for shooting. That's obviously where Curry factors in. He was huge in this game. But I thought my favorite thing was them transitioning to more horns to pull the Kings away from just loading up in the center of the court. Super nice to see. Give your guys an opportunity to get downhill if you're Tobias Harris or run around a screen and catch a shot for an open jumper if you're Seth Curry. Playing to their strengths. And not only that, but Ben Simmons running a staggered screen action with Tobias as the first guy so he can slip into shooting space or Embiid if they get troubled getting around the Tobias screen and they have to kind of send help, then Embiid can just go right to the rim and after that, they just flow into a dribble handoff. Beautiful, wonderful, <laughs> just a staggered screen. And who's the dribble handoff with? Seth Curry. Well, a three-pointer for me, don't mind if I do. Just really simplistic actions. They're very talented. They had the defense to stop a lot of what the Kings like to do. And they held on to win. But it required shot-making from Embiid down the road. And the Kings did a pretty good job of snuffing out a lot of what the 76ers do. And that's, you know, the benefit and the downfall of having simplistic actions is at the end of a game, a team can kind of really sell out to stop it. But Embiid having the ball in his hands and just hitting a mid-range jumper over a defense that's saying, what's next? They won. And the Kings tried hard at the end, but the 76ers are the better team. They played a great game. I thought they ran a lot of fun stuff just for them. And MVP Embiid is right there for the whole world to watch. I I really suggest you watch as much 76ers as you can because Embiid every night is an absolute pleasure. And Fox was on the other side as well. Right. Um, Any thoughts on Tobias Harris? Because I have a few. I I do. Tobias has always been good. Tobias is good. He's a top 50 player. People always, this always happens to guys who get their perceived overpay, right? Tobias Harris, by what the league considers a max player, he is not. He has not been, not for a moment, but he's getting basically that money. And the 76ers gave it to him and not Jimmy Butler. It always is going to be weighing on Tobias that there's these expectations of what he's supposed to be for the money he's making. Who cares? You're on the team. Play to the best of your abilities. He's a heat pump. He's really smart on offense, cutting. He's advantageous and opportunistic. If he sees a post up, he can go get, he'll slide in. If he sees a screen, he can set on the backside to free a teammate. He'll do that. Find soft spots in the defense. Has been hitting his shots is good in the regimented actions that the 76ers run and has been much better as a lone ball handler and that that in this game as well too, pick and rolls, carrying bench units. He's been doing it. Tobias Harris has been great this year. Max, I don't know, but who cares? He's on the team. He's making money. 
He's on one of the best teams in the league, playing a very important role. He's been good this year. Yeah. I would say 20 points a game on 50-40, 89.9. Pretty good. Pretty good. It's the, I, th- I believe it's the growth of everything that is working out. It's not necessarily that he's making more shots. It's that he is just more efficient with the shots he's shooting. He's definitely not – this isn't a career high number um, of three-point attempts for him. It's, it's actually – one of the one of the lowest in a little while. It's just a shade over four a game right now, and the last few years it's been five or five and a half or thereabouts. So he's getting more efficient, and I just think um, I don't necessarily know if they ran it against Sacramento, but one of my favorite things, like you're talking about horns, that reminded me of this is they'll have. Sometimes it's Shake, sometimes it's Seth, but like you said, jo- if Joel and Tobias are in that are aligned on those elbows, so the smaller smaller guard will go set a screen for Tobias, enter the ball into Joel, set a screen for Tobias, and then Tobias is just coming off um, from let's say the right elbow. He's coming going left elbow. It's a dribble handoff from Joel and what Tobias has gotten so good at is he can either take it to the basket um, or he will drift left-handed dribble, two dribbles, bump, step back into space. And he's baiting the strong side corner defender into digging because he's just so close that as a defender, you see the ball right there. You want to just swipe. So that's, help one pass away, easy triple. Or he's making that mid-range jumper. He's just, he's been very good everywhere per synergy. He's just, you know, if you look at the numbers, it's very good, excellent, very good, excellent, very good, excellent, just about everywhere. And he's just doing a lot of things in a lot of different ways. That's all you want. He's always been a very smart player. It's the feel, right? The feel has always been like, maybe a little bit lower, reacting to a different type of defense, Tobias might take a little bit longer. But they're running a lot of sets that are beneficial to him, and he's finding his spot, his spots in so many different areas for the 76ers this year. It's a very interesting team. They're coalescing quite well, and all around the sun, that is Joel Embiid. But I, I enjoyed that game immensely. It, was, uh, it contained two of my favorite players, Fox, and Bede, and they both, I thought, were immaculate. I'm so glad they're both having the years that they are. It's, it's fun. Yeah. I'm, should the 76ers have three All-Stars? I don't know. But I think, I think, if you could only go with two, Tobias Harris is making a very strong case. People wow. sleep on. <laughs> so when we talked about um, Giannis it's that same thing of everybody wants to talk about what Ben Simmons can't do he's one of the do you what do you think about this he's one of the top five defenders in the league regardless of position I uh it was in my notes I think I was supposed to mention this while I was saying that De'Aaron Fox cooked him a couple times that that's a big deal because De'Aaron is great, but because Ben is maybe the best wing defender in the whole NBA, which by proxy of that, it depends how you view defense, right? Because wing defenders can be the most important at times because of their ability to transcend guard type defense, perimeter defense, and then also help out a bunch at the rim. As I said, Ben contesting shots and containing both of those things he's quite good at. Top five, I'm, it's, I don't think it's too friendly to say that you can put him in the top five defenders in the league and you shouldn't receive that much resistance from people. He's, he's great. Right. And the thing that they are doing a little less, I feel, and based on, just based on the games that I'm watching, I, don't, I, I will not claim to have watched every 76ers game, is they are 
what Ben is doing is he is not guarding in the post as much. Like they'll have him in there for spells. So when I did my Ben Simmons defense video last season, it was he'll fight you in the post and he won't give ground to fives to centers to when they are looking to post up, he's not going anywhere because he's huge, but they are putting him in less of those positions because he is such a threat on the wing. And I don't know if that's accurate. I will get back to you later in the season after I watch more to see if that is really the case, but it's just, that's how it feels. They are maximizing what he is great at while also minimizing could he be a good post defender? Yes, absolutely. Like I said, he's huge. He has great instincts. But is he best there? No. He's, uh, that's one of the things is in the NBA, some guys have an immense amount of skills. And we would rather say make all of them perfect than say, holy smokes, this guy has a bunch of skills. But then there's – there's guys like PJ Tucker who has like three skills and everybody is like, Oh my God, can you believe this guy has three skills? He's so good at these skills. And that's, you know, that's the nature of me. That's human nature, right? Is more, 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 and especially relative to success and excellence. But Ben does a lot of things right on the floor all the time. And this, I, Hot take, I think Pascal Siakam is better than Ben Simmons. He hasn't had a better season. I think he's better, though. And, but Ben is exceptional. Ben is great. And I think he's, if I had to pick, I'd go Ben and Embiid rather than Embiid and Tobias. But that's just me. Although I think it's more likely I'd rather have one 76er than I would have three to be quite honest. I don't know if that's crazy because the, the league has been so topsy turvy this year that I don't even think you should reward the top end teams for with so many extra all-stars because they're the top end teams. Like what we usually see, because it's not like the 76ers are running away with anything. Correct. And neither are the bucks and neither is. So, you know, there, there should be more first time all-stars this year than I think we're used to. And, uh, yeah, just make sure Russell Westbrook isn't on the team. I guess that's my only quibble. <laughs> yeah, we, we talk about this off the pod. There's so many, like, should be all-stars. Like, Julius Randle, should he be an all-star? I don't know. But I don't think Julius Randle, Colin Sexton, Jeremy Grant, Vucevic, I don't think they're going to – I don't think they're going to make it. But if gun to my head, I don't know that Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown should make it. I just because if if no team if no team gets two, then okay, fine, the two of them. But if there are more teams, especially with Boston dropping to five hundred. That's, you know, that, that has less to do with what Jason and Jalen are doing. But now they're a 500 team. My biggest thing about um, Vooch as an all-star, I've been working on a video for his. And, like, every time I think I'm done, he has 34 against the Bulls and 40 against the Kings. It's just like, I got to include that stuff. Now they're 10 and 17, and it's been a free fall. And it becomes harder to make the case for an all-star if they're not winning. I don't know. I don't think the Raptors will have an all-star this year. And that's not to say they won't deserve it, but I, I have a tough time seeing Fred Van Vliet having coaches cape for him to the point that he sneaks in. You right. know, that type of thing. I don't think the Raptors will have one. I don't, think, I don't think Randall will get in. But as you say, it's kind of crazy to think, okay, Randall won't make it. Grant won't make it. Vooch won't make it. Like, the East is so heavy with all-stars this year, despite not having that, that many good teams as currently, you know, the standings might indicate because the standings are crazy everywhere, but just having KD Harden and Kyrie, all of whom are making the game, Giannis and Chris are making the game. 
Like, it's just Beal is making the game. Why not Zach Levine? Because he has absurd offensive numbers. They're truly, truly insane. Domas, why not? You know, there's just Embiid, Ben, Tobias. There's a lot. And it's a it's very different from when Joe Johnson got in scoring like 14 points a game and Lance Stevenson felt aggrieved because he had what, like 12 and six. And he's like, 12 and six doesn't get into the all-star game anymore. Huh? Am I crazy? And Roy Hibbert was putting up like what, 11 and five. And they're like, this guy is an all-star. And now everything has just been so supercharged that, you know, Trey Young, (laughs) like, there's, there's just a lot of things going on. There's a lot of numbers, and there's a lot of middling teams, and that's where it gets really hard to parse out all-stars. I'm yeah. excited to see what it looks like. But. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, at the time of this recording, Chicago has 10 games. Zach Levine is, by all accounts, an all-star. There's nothing we can do about voting. Um, but Bradley Beal, <laughs> feel bad for Bradley Beal. Yes, fine, give him an all-star, but his team has six wins. Like, what, what are we doing? Um, Miami has is 11 and 15. Do they have an all-star? I think they do. There's yeah. so much goodwill for Bam and his, yeah. his performance in the playoffs. And Bam, and he added something too. So it's not like he's plateaued. Because Siakam has added the passing this year, but he's seen as plateauing in a lot of other areas. And people like to vote for progression. And that's why I thought Van Vliet would be the most likely, but he's not progressing in a sexy enough way. And then you have guys like Zach Levine or Trey Young, who their offensive numbers are just through the moon and they're pumping it up. Randall, Vooch, Grant, like there's so many guys who in other years would have made it that this year it's starting to get like more difficult, but Jimmy won't be there because of games. I'm sure. Yeah. So Yeah. I mean, the Charlotte Hornets have a better record than, the Knicks, the Raptors, the Heat. N- Hayward is an all star, probably. Yeah. Hayward is probably I, an all star. Yeah. There's I just love, a lot. Yeah. That's, I agree. But my, my whole point was with the Jalen Jason thing, because, you know, if you're going to take that clip and nobody's taking clips from here and taking them out of context, it's fine. I'm I am. Not, I'm sending them to my <laughs> friends. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Uh, but it's just, Philly deserves, deserves to. If Brooklyn's going to get three. They are. Like, they I are. I know. That, yeah, that's the, but that's the problem. It's Brooklyn gets three, then Philly deserves at least two. You seem upset that Brooklyn yeah. is getting three. Who, who, do, who don't you have? I love Kyrie Irving. I will never, ever not <laughs> love Kyrie Irving. But what do you want me to do? I love what it. What do you want me to do? <laughs> I love it. Because, because you can't – because when it comes to these types of conversations, you're not leaving off a guy who's been in the top three in MVP voting every year for the last seven years or whatever it is. And you're not leaving off the greatest story in the NBA right now is Kevin Durant being the second best basketball player to come back from uh, an Achilles injury. Number, my, my number one, Brianna Stewart. That was- but, because <laughs> – MVP finals MVP won a title. Like I don't, if KD wins a title, yeah, we can talk about that, but he's still, he's only 20 something games in. So I love Kyrie and all of the stuff he does. And his game is all-star game worthy, but like Brooklyn can't have three. That's what it hurts. I would rather see the roster expanded. So if you do get Brooklyn three, then, Hey, let's talk about Malcolm Brogdon. I don't think he's going to make it, but I think he deserves consideration. Yeah. I, I hope they expand it and then we hit like another drought and the <laughs> Stevensons, Johnsons, Hibberts all get in. Like Wendell Carter Jr. gets into the All Star game three years from now, averaging like 12, seven, and like four. And he's having a good defensive year. And everybody's like, you got to get him in a game. We got 24 spots now. Put him in. I'd love that. Precious, pre- precious, R.J. Barrett, you know, all of Put them. Put him in the get game. All, get all of them in. 
I'm not saying that they're, that they're not going to be all stars. RJ has been fun this year, and I think Precious has some Bam like things. If he starts doing more Bam things, then maybe one day. But you know, if we're campaigning, Isaiah Stewart, somebody I watched in that Pistons game, yo, that dude wants to murder you. He's going to get in a game one day. That's what happened. You move, you move to Detroit. You start listening to Danny Brown. All of a sudden, you're catching assault charges because you listen to Danny Brown and you just feel violent all of a sudden. Dance in the water and not get wet, you know? <laughs> <sighs> oh, that syncopated oh, madman, Danny Brown. I love your music. You don't listen to this podcast, but I'm talking to Danny. I love your stuff. Okay. That feels like a podcast, Evan. <laughs> I'm glad yeah. we made time for Danny Brown. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's when the games of the week are, they're as interesting in terms of the Blake Griffin stuff and the, are the Celtics going to be okay uh, with two of their guys missing, no matter how good Jalen and Tatum are. And you have conversations about, Maybe the MVP, narrative aside, maybe the MVP, or at least the MV, at the very least, the MVP of the East, if we're, we're going to parse stuff like that, and the guy who's going to make the next great leap. I, there's just no, not a lot of room to talk about anyone else. We didn't talk about you at all. Who are you talking about? <laughs> Joe okay, Ingles. so, yeah. Joe Ingles. Shout out <laughs> to my fellow receding hairline brother. Okay, so anyway, my game of the week for you. I know you love Eric Spolstra. I also happen to know you love this Steph Curry guy. So Heat, Warriors, Wednesday oh, night. No. That's yours. And oh, I know you'll no. like that. So I'm doing you a favor. Oh, no. By the way, you were like a week and a half early on the Jazz. Everybody's talking about the Jazz now. Yes. And, the funniest, and the funniest part, literally the funniest part to me, is that you were like a week and a half early, and we talked about them while they were just finishing up an 11-game win streak, and we were still early. Isn't that right. hilarious? That is so funny to me. <laughs> Poor Utah fans. Oh, my God. I know. I know. Um, oof. I'll give you I'll give you an option because just because I've given you so much Hornets, I feel like already. Nuggets Hornets on Friday the nineteenth. You think Bless about that? my beard. More Hornets for me? Perfect. Or the team we talk about so much already, despite never having been given a game of the week honor. Uh, Nets Kings. A Nets game. Hmm. I don't want to do Kings two weeks in a row. Okay. I'll probably watch that game regardless, so I'll remark upon it when we get to it. But as for the game of the week... Is the game you gave me a national... It has to be. A national TV game? Yeah, probably is. All right, let's do this. Let's do this then. Um, Your choice of the Hornets thing again. Or Nets Suns. I would do Nets Suns because I've done Nuggets, I've done Kings, and I've done Hornets. So I'll do yeah. Nets Suns. Checking in on the scintillating Devin Booker. The, and the, all the Ben Simmons drama with him. Yeah. Where everybody's like, he stole Kendall Jenner by beating him at basketball. Can you believe it? <laughs> let's, let's make that the thumbnail for the podcast and see how many clicks we get. Oh, my God. Did, did Devin Booker steal Kendall Jenner or what? And then we're talking about, I'm like, the staggered screen action that flows into the dribble handoff. I just love it. They're like, we want the gossip, the hot goss, please. We should, have, we should have a solid five minutes of just hot goss corner. And then it's just, just the stupidest stuff. What uh, if, or if, it, if it's hot goss corner and we just – we sit together and we rate pictures of hot Ryan Gosling. I knew that's where you were going. And, and we talk about like, how good does he look here? And I'm pretty sure you've seen it, the picture where I attempt, I'll put it up where I recreated uh, the Ryan Gosling picture from the nice guys. Oh it's yeah, yeah, yeah. 
significantly underrated film, by the way. Like, yeah, so good. But Shane Black, yeah. shout, shout out to shout out to Shane Black, who's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you're listening, and you won't be in like 20 seconds because we're getting out of here. But Evan, first of all, thanks for letting me hop on this channel you got here. It's so great, and uh, always, thanks man, for time for me absolutely it's always fun and the conversations that we have off the pod so much longer and so much more in depth so if you if you're imagining what it's like between the two of us over the phone it's it's way worse way worse way worse and uh if you if you subscribe on patreon for 28 dollars a month you can hear them we'll publish our text (laughs) okay There's a classic song playing that hopefully doesn't get this video banned in countries. And uh, we'll see ya. Okay. Feels like a podcast. Nightmare. (laughs) Type 35. We're only talking about games. We're becoming less efficient.